yes. Uh, right, so, awesome. good afternoon, Thank everybody. You. Welcome to Morris Federation online event. And today we've got Peter Barron telling us about the Abram dance and how to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> so, if I, I'd like to hand over straight to Peter. Right, I'll just share my screen, hopefully. Oh, where's it gone? I'm sure it's gone to me. Right, okay, hopefully everyone can see the screen and hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'll assume you can unless uh, I get some shouts. So as uh, Pauline said, I'm talking about the history of the Abra Morris dance, but also of the Morris dancers' ground. Uh, and she said, put any questions in the chat. I can't see them the way mine's set up at the moment anyway, so I won't see them till the end. But hopefully we'll have a bit of a discussion at the end. So as this is mainly a Morris audience, well, I did notice a few individuals on. I don't know if any of them are from Abram itself. Uh, but I won't go into the various types of dance around the country. But as I'm sure most of you know, here in Lancashire we have our own versions of Morris. There's the ones from the Pennine area, where the dancers often wearing clogs. And the dancers from the Lancashire Plain, where the participants usually wore shoes. Uh, most of which go back no further than the 1890s. And then, of course, there's the Morris dancers, as in the girl uh, teams uh, who are very strong at the moment. We are just talking about it with Pauline beforehand, uh, sometimes known as Carnival Morris dancers. However, the Abram Morris dance is nothing like any of them. Um, and the dance is danced uh, by teams all over the country, so I'm sure most of you have seen it. And not only this country, across the world it's danced. But it was revived in Abram itself in 1984 by Jeff Hughes. And it's now danced on the last Saturday in June every year, starting at the Morris Dancers Ground. And we even had a token gesture of one dancer, two musicians, uh, socially distanced in 2020. Um, now I was at this point going to show a very brief clip of the dance, but I'm going to show the full dance at the end. Uh, but I had problems with the video for the brief clip I was going to show, so you can just have the, the final bit. It finishes... Uh, in a huge circle like that, but the whole dance in a circle, so this immediately makes it quite different from other Morris dances you might have seen. Uh, there's the maypole in the middle, and uh, there's a queen and a king there. You can see the queen, the king's hidden by her. Now I'm sure, so where did this dance come from? I'm sure you've all heard of Maud Carpelis, there she is. And in December 1932, she published an article on two folk dances in the first ever journal of the English Folk Dance and Song Society. Why isn't it going on? There we go. And most of that article is given over to a description of the Abram Morris dance. And the dance was described to her by Richard Porter, who had died, unfortunately, by the time the article was actually published. But she gives a full description of the dance as collected together with the music and some background detail. She also provides some background information on the Morris dancers ground. Now the dance was last performed traditionally in inverted commas in 1901 and before that in 1880 and she describes the, the dance as follows. The dancers were accompanied by two clowns who carried long wooden ladles in which they collected money a king and a queen who was impersonated by an unmarried woman. The king and queen carried between them a garland. This is a wooden erection shaped like a beehive borne on top of a pole, about six, six feet in length. It was made of wooden hoops and was trimmed with leaves and ribbons, whilst watches and silver ornaments were suspended from it. And a silver teapot was placed on the top. And you can see a representation of this if you go into Wigan on the road signs. So, and in, in a footnote, she compared the way the garland was decorated with similar manifestations, including Lancashire rush carts. She stated that the garland was described to me by Mr. Porter as being a branch of a tree, and he called it the bush. But she could find no evidence of such a bush ever having been used at Abram and suggested that Mr. Porter must have confused it with some other ceremony he had heard of. She then went on to discuss the Caddy Ha dance in Wales, which does have a bush attached. 
and until my research a few years ago no one had been able to cast any further light on the bush. She also goes on to describe the Morris Dancers ground in Abram as unoccupied and unenclosed measuring about 21 yards by 14 yards. And she continues it's generally believed that the land was granted to the dancers many years ago on condition that they danced it once in every 21 years. A plain undecorated maypole used to stand in the centre of the ground which is now surrounded on three sides by the works of the maypole colliery so called because the land where the pits are sunk form part of a farm called Maypole Farm. The Wigan Coal Corporation had wished to acquire the Morris Dancers ground which adjoins the site of the farm but were unable to do so as it appeared that there were no title deeds in existence. So I'm not going to say any more about the Morris Dancers ground at the moment. I'll come on to that later. So as I said the dance was collected by Maud Carpley's from Richard Porter. So who was he? He was born in Hindley in 1875, son of a collier. And he danced with the Hindley Green Morris Dancers, which formed in 1891 and existed until at least 1898. And then he later trained his own team of Morris Dancers in Hindley around 1910. Now in the early 1980s, Tony Dan, who some of you may know, was researching Hindley Green and Hindley Morris Dancers. And in the course of his research, Richard Porter's family gave him photocopies of a notebook. Come on. There we go, the notebook. <laughs> Photocop of a notebook that contained his dances. Among these was one headed Old English Morris Dance, dance 100 years old. And this appears to be Richard Porter's own notation of the Abram Morris Dance. And on a different page, is written Adam Ingram, Abram Morris Dancers. And it says, it says 86 afterwards, but the six is very indistinct. It could be 81 or 83. I'll let you make your own mind up about that. And on the same page above it is a, a notation for Shotish. Um, but as there's a couple of lines between the Shotish and his name, and his name's got a box around it, I don't think the two are connected at all. And Adam Ingram was one of the people that was interviewed by Maud Carpelis and by a Miss C. Holborough, I think that's Clarice if I remember rightly, who was organising secretary of the Mersey, the Mersey and Deeside branch of the English Folk Dance Society. And she, she went and visited him on Maud Carpelis' behalf. So this is a picture of uh, Adam Ingram and his sister Eve. So after Maud Carpelis had published the dance. It was taken up by many Morris teams around the world, often incorrectly referred to as the Abram Circle Dance. I've already mentioned Jeff Hughes, and although hailing... Oh, well, shall we have a picture of Jeff Hughes? Why not? There he is. Although hailing from North London, he married a local girl and moved into Platte Bridge, which is uh, the next village to Abram. He was a very experienced dancer, having first danced in a school team in Chingford, and after coming north, he founded the Rumworth Morris in Bolton in 1976. But he already knew the Abram dance and decided it should be danced in its rightful place, the Morris Dancers Ground in Abram. He undertook some new research into the dance, which added to the background information that Maud Carpers had already published. And then there's also further information in Maud Carpers' manuscripts, which are held at the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library. So together with a group of dancing friends that he already knew and other local people that came along following a newspaper advertisement, he reformed the Abram Morris Dancers. And they performed on the Morris Dancers ground in May 1984 and then since then we've done it annually on the last Saturday in June. So what do we know about the dance? Well, until relatively recently, the oldest records we had were from 1880. And there's several, di several different reports from that year. On the 16th of July, the Wigan Observer described the ancient festival Abram called the Morris Dance, which took place over two days on Friday the 9th of July and Saturday the 10th of July. And a very similar report appeared in the Wigan Observer, sorry, the Wigan Examiner, a day later. So here's what the 
Wigan Observer said. A correspondent writes, on the estate of Miss Chadwick in Park Lane, Abram, there is a plot of ground which has been bequeathed to the young men of Abram for the purpose of celebrating the above festival on the condition that the young men celebrate the festival at least every 21 years, or else the ground be lost to the young forever. Twelve years having elapsed since the ancient festival was celebrated, a number of the young men formed themselves together for instruction under Messrs T. Burns, W. Burns and R. Flides, all of Abram. They assembled together on Friday morning last at the sorry, Friday morning last at the Red Line in Dover, Abram, to celebrate the ancient festival. A few minutes delay was caused by the non arrival of the Queen, but she made up for it by her beautiful appearance. She wore a dress of black velvet trimmed with old gold satin and white lace. Her headdress was a white hat trimmed with gold lace, all from the form firm Miss Smith and Company Abram. The King wore black, black coat and trousers and white vest, a white straw hat trimmed with Scottish plaid ribbons. The dancers wore white, white vests and straw hats, and blue sashes bound with red and white. The garland was de decorated by Mrs Constantine Moore of Abram, with jewels and silver from friends and neighbours who lent them for the occasion. Everything took exceedingly well, but the day turned out very wet. The party danced at the principal places on their way through Warrington Lane, Platte Bridge, Low Green, Hinley, The Grange, then crossed over into Bickershaw Lane and danced for Mr J A Ackers at Brookside, and then they proceeded to the principal places in Bickershaw and Abram, returning to Red Lion in Dover at about nine o'clock. That's a distance of about seven and a half miles. On Saturday, they wended their way through Ashton, Goulburn, Goulburn Park, Lowton, Plank Lane, returning to the Red Lion in Dover at about eight o'clock. And that, depending on what route they took, it's probably more like ten miles. Anyway, where a sumptuous dinner awaited them, provided by the worthy host and hostess, Mr and Mrs Hart. After partaking of the good things provided, the tables were cleared and dancing resumed until close on 11 o'clock, when they returned to their homes, not a bit the worse for their hard day's dancing. It has been decided that after the expenses are paid, the dancers will make a donation of the surplus to the Wigan Infirmary. So that's what was in the paper. Um, a local chap who lived at the Grange, which I think I, think I just mentioned, um, John Leyland, he uh, produced the Memorials of Abram in uh, 1882, and he published a, re a report on it, and that repeats a lot of what I've just read out, but there's some slight differences um, and extra details. He says the period of the dance must be performed every 20 years, not 21. The dance probably only survives because of this requirement. There were 14 dancers. There was a king, queen, a jester and an impersonator of Robin Hood. There was a band of music. The top of the pole was pear-shaped and decorated with ribbons. Suspended from it were a teapot and cream, cream jugs, apparently of silver. His description of the costume is uh, similar to the newspaper, but he says blue sashes edged in pink rather than red. And he says the dance was last performed 14 years earlier. But he also kept a diary. Oh. So this is his entry for July the 9th. Received a note this morning from the Abram Morris dancers saying they intended to visit the Grange in the forenoon. They came, but not until the afternoon. A band of musicians led them up and they arranged themselves in front of the house. The dance they performed was quiet and graceful and they went through it exceedingly well. In Park Lane Abram, a small square of land has belonged from time immemorial to the young men of the township for the use of Morris dancing and a tradition exists that if the custom be not celebrated once in 21 years, their right in the land ceases. Accordingly, every now and then the custom is revived, and 11 years have passed since it was last kept up. Once, only many years ago, I saw it, and was therefore pleased to be a spectator again. Oh. 
Putting your notes on an iPad's fine unless it goes off during the middle. Anyway, these, uh, these reports do actually throw up some discrepancies. John Leyland gives both 20 and 21 years in the two accounts, although all the other references are 21 years. The newspaper report said the last occasion it was carried out was 12 years previously, that would be 1868, but John Leyland gives both 14 years and 11 years, 1866 or 69. And to date, uh, no one's found any reports that uh, confirm any of those years. And there is one final reference from 1880, which Cecilia Hughes found, that's Jeff's wife, uh, when she was working at St Nathaniel's Primary School in Platte Bridge, in the uh, in a log book, um, just the, um, the for the the entry for the 9th of July says allowed to see the, sorry try again allowed the boys to see the Morris dancers at 11:45, and there is a picture of the Queen Miss West of the Abram Morris dance. So that's what we know about 1880. Um, so as I said, the uh, story goes um, that the Morris Dancers Ground had to be danced on at least every 21 years. And sure enough, in 1901, 21 years later, two very similar adverts appeared in the Wigan Examiner and the Wigan Observer. This is the one from the examiner. Uh, Abram Ancient Morris Dance, it is proposed to hold the above this year, and young men wishing to join must apply to Adam Ingram, Pinest Farm, Park Lane Abram, J. Smith on sec. But to date, no report of that, that event has been found. Um, but there, were some, there was a picture taken, and there's lots of versions of this around. It's, it's all the same picture. It keeps occurring in different places. This is a version that Jeff Hughes was given by one of the residents of Abram. And it says Abram Morris Dance, July the 1st, 1901. So we have a date for it. Um, this is a picture I got out of uh, Wigan Archives. Uh, it's a bit bigger, so hopefully you can see the characters on it. You've got the dancers. There's a maypole in the middle. Uh, presumably the Queen and King on either side. Lurking behind the maypole, it might not be able to see. There's a person who presumably is the pole carrier. Uh, either side, there's uh, a clown. That's two clowns altogether. And then there's various other people in attendance. Uh, irritating, there's no sign of any musicians of any sort. So that's all we knew about the 1901. performance. So, with uh, newspapers being digitised, it's now possible to pick up references which might have been missed before. And I suddenly came across this a while ago, um, from the Liverpool Mail, dated 20th of July 1850. I mean, if you were going through newspapers, you wouldn't be looking in Liverpool for something about Abram. And it's just a very brief thing saying that uh, the Morris dance took place on St. Swithin's Day. And you can read it there. But it gives the source of the article as being the Wigan Times. Now the Wigan Times for July 1850 is not held in the local archives. Uh, and it's not yet been digitised. But luckily the British Library does have a copy. So off I went to Boston Spa Reading Room to check out the paper. Uh, and the article on the dance was in the 19th of July edition. And I really wasn't expecting the Wigan Times to say much more than had been said in the Liverpool Mail. But I was very wrong. It's actually an extremely long article. And the middle section of it talks about what Morris dancing is all about. Uh, so... It's, it's of interest because it shows what newspapers and people were saying Morris Dancing was about in 1850. Um, but it, the first bit of it and the second bit of it um, is all about the Abram Dance. Uh, um, so I'm going to read out that. It's quite long. Hmm. 
Morris Dance at Abram. On Monday last, St Swithin's Day, there was a Morris Dance through the whole of the village of Abram. The dancers were young unmarried men who reside within the township and they assembled together at a plot of land bequeathed to them some hundred years ago by an ardent admirer of this rural sport on condition that a Morris dance should be held at least every 21 years. The land is large enough to build two moderately sized houses upon it. From this place they proceeded in a circuitous route through the village calling at every house where there was a probability of obtaining the needful each dancer being provided with two clean handkerchiefs which they strike against each other as we might suppose the ancient Morris dancers did with their staves or swords. We still retain the fool and the piper, the latter being improved into a band. We have also in our modern dance a queen or belle as she is now called who has a protector carrying a cur curiously devised garland which on the commencement of the dance he presents to her, whilst the young men proceed with their dancing. At the conclusion they form a ring around the blushing maiden, each one throwing his pocket handkerchief in the air as if honouring and congratulating Her Majesty. The fool, or merry man, performs nearly the same duties as all that class of humorists do, with the addition of a wooden ladle the rim of which he chalks and then transcribes the circle to the backs of all who come within his reach. The dress of the Morris dancer is a clean white linen shirt, no coat and trousers ad libitum. Over the whole of the body are ribbons of various colours and in some visible place is placed as being or should be a watch. The garland now appears to be considered the most important part of the game for it certainly is made with no little pains or trouble. The skeleton of it is a piece of wood about seven feet long, round the top of which and suspended therefrom are two other pieces which hang down about three feet and almost form the appearance of an umbrella. These are decorated with twenty or thirty watches, as many silver teaspoons and numerous ribbons of various colours which give a very pleasing contrast with the watches and spoons. At the top are placed two brass eagles and upon them is a beautiful silver goblet. Besides this garland they carried another similar in its construction made of evergreens. Morris dances are few and far between. Eighteen years have interviewed, intervened between this and the last and the same number of years between that and the previous dance and before then there was no dance for twenty years. There are many living who remember the dance fifty-six years ago and whose fathers told them that before that time they were held almost annually. The prima preceptor of the present dance, Mr George Livesey, to whom too much praise cannot be awarded for his exertions and skill in bringing the performances to such perfection, has himself attended three dances. We remember at the last Morris dance, a question arose as to the title of the young men of Abram to the plot of land mentioned before. But it was overruled by the attempted claimant paying several pounds as compensation for felling trees which grew upon the land. We do not find any trace to a good title to it, but in the absence of other claimants, we suppose custom gives them just claim. The name of the belle or queen is Charity Cunley, a very modest and pretty girl, and her protector on the occasion was Robert Fort, a young man of pleasing appearance. Abram Atkins, the squire of Bickershaw Hall, and a Strachan Esquire of Brookside House, were kind enough to supply them with most of the materials for the garlands. During the whole of the day, especially towards evening, hundreds of people, both old and young, of both sexes, followed the dancers, and about half past nine, the dancers and their friends sat down at the Book's Head Abram, where the hostess, Mrs John Dean, had prepared some excellent potato pie, in the making of which she is proverbial as conducing to the palates of those who patronise her. We were much pleased to observe that the men generally were sober, and conducted themselves with strict propriety and quietness. For two or three days previously, we understand, a spurious company of Morris dancers have been out, but with little success. So quite an amazing article, an amazing amount of detail in it. So from all that, we've now got sort of a chronological order of when the dance was performed. 
Um, some of these only come from the newspaper, so uh, you have to be a bit careful with dates. But according to that, it was before 1794, more or less annually. Then in 1794, then in 1814, and in 1832, and then definitely in 1850 because of that report. There appears to be a performance in 1860s, but um, various possible years of 66, 68, or 69. And then there were definitely performances in 1880 and 1901. There were also a couple of non-traditional outings of the dance. Again, these have got thrown up with being able to uh, with uh, digitised newspapers and being able to search. Uh, the year after the 1880 performance, uh, the dancers appeared in um, at Bell Green Inns, which is about two and a half miles to the north of Abram, um, at the May Day festi festivities there. And they, uh, they had the Queen with a with them, shall I say. So it's the 30th of April. Um, a newspaper report of that says, uh, Then came the Abram Morris dancers headed by their Queen, Miss West. This was their first appearance in Ince, and they formed a valuable addition to the festivities. They were much admired as they passed along. And then further down the same article it says, The Morris dancers were the next to take their place on the platform, with their Queen, Miss West, holding a garland. The dance commenced and proved highly interesting. The interchange and handkerchief manip manipulations being very well executed. And then if you can see that on the, uh, the advert, it says, uh, for the dancing, uh, the general dancing at the end, music will be supplied by the Morris Dancers Band. And then in 1887, there's a couple of rep newspaper reports from the crowning of the May Queen in Goulburn, that's about two and a half miles to the south of Abram. Uh, one of them says the Morris dance, which is a new feature at this festival, was ably given by 18 young men who were instructed by Mr. Perrin of Abram. And then there's this one, which I think is the Wigan Observer, is it? No, it's the League Chronicle, sorry. Um, and then the Abram Maypole dancers, under the direction of Mr. Perrin, gave the ancient Morris dance waving their white handkerchiefs in the air to the merry music. And there's a couple of non-dancing references as well to them um, from 1888 and 89. Both these come from the Wigan Observer. Uh, the Infirmary Gala. A meeting of the Gala Committee. The Abram Morris dancers were not able to come on account of the short notice. That was 1888. And then the following year... Uh, Infirmary Gala, a meeting of the General Gala Committee was held on Wednesday evening. The Abram Morris dancers are to be communicated with. So, from what we found so far, oh, I did, oh, sorry, did just say before going on to that, Adam Ingram. In, in Lord Carpley's notes, says that uh, he danced in 1868, 1882 and 1891. 1868 is a possible date for, um, it's, well, it's one of the three dates for the 1860s. 82 and 91 aren't, uh, but if it, it could refer to um, dancing outside the area. Um, but given, given the fact that he specifically started um, raised a team for 1901 to keep the 21-year uh, cycle going, um, it, uh, it seems unlikely that in 82 and, eight, and 91 he uh, danced at the, uh, with the Morris dancers in Abram. Of course, he may just have got his dates wrong. So characteristics of the dance, the music. Uh, the actual notes for it were provided by Richard Porter to Maud Carpley's when she collected the dance off him in 1931. We've got very little information about the instruments used. In both 1850 and 1880 it refers to a band 
but no indication of what the instruments might have been. Adam Ingram says a man called Seddon, that's S-E-D-D-E-N, played concertina for them. Uh, it's just possible that was John Seddon, S-E-D-D-O-N, who was a conductor of the English Concertina Band. That's a band of English concertinas. Uh, and he played locally. And as I said before, in 1881 performance, the Morris Dancers Band appears to have played for general dancing as well as the Morris Dance. The costume, the descriptions from 1880 and the photograph of 1901 show similar costumes. Black trousers, white waistcoats, straw boater, blue sash edged in red or pink, white handkerchiefs. And the main difference in 1850 seems to be that instead of a white waistcoat, it was a white shirt covered in ribbons of various colours. The characters uh, changed a little over the years. In 1850, the two main characters were called the Bell or Queen and Protector. Later reports are Queen and King. And the fools or clowns are in attendance in all the reports. And John Leyland says there was a personator of Robin Hood, but that's not mentioned anywhere else. Then we come to the garland and the evergreen garland. The description of the garland is similar in the various reports. But in 1850, there was an additional evergreen garland. So this is possibly the bush that Richard Porter was referring to and was discounted by Maud Carpelis. Done a bit of research into the participants, this is just a few of them. Um, the Bell, or Queen in 1850, was Charity Cunley, she, she's also known as Cunley, the, the two names get interchanged locally. Um, but she was probably the cousin of Mrs Constantine Moore who provided the decorations for the 1880 garland. I say probably because there are just so many Cunley Cunley families it's, it's, absolutely, it's impossible to be absolutely definitive but I'm pretty certain it is. Robert Fort, the protector in 1850, was the brother-in-law to Thomas Burns and William Burns, two of the trainers of the 1880 team. And uh, Charity Cunley, she she married Robert Fort in 1853. So it's likely the third trainer, it was given as R. Flies in the newspaper report I read out, but in the other newspaper report, it says R, I don't know how to pronounce that, T-L-Y-D-L-E-S, Clydes. Anyway, I think, I think it's a misspelling of Richard Tilsley. Um, if you see Tilsley's name written down on official documents, um, it looks like flies, because it flies and then squiggle, squiggle, squiggle. So I suspect that uh, a handwritten copy was given to the newspapers and they've interpreted it accordingly. But if it is Richard Tilsley, that's Adam Ingram's grandfather. And in 1880, both Richard Tilsley and Adam Ingram were living in Pineas Farm, the address for Adam Ingram in the 1901 advert. From local people and um, from Maud Carpley's um, notes, 13 participants have been identified. Uh, of those, seven worked in collieries, this is from the 1901 performance, seven worked in collieries, three were farm workers and one a farmer, one was a chip fish dealer, whatever that is, and one was a plumber. A I've been unable to identify the Queen, Miss West, in 1880 and 81. I've put there's too many potential candidates. I think there's really only two candidates, but uh, I, I really can't say which it is. And in the, 19, in the 1932 paper, Maud Carpley's says that after performing on the Morris Dancers' ground, the dancers processed through the streets doing what they called the Long Morris, which appeared to be a simple form of dance resembling Winston Processional. Nothing of this dance has come to light, however in Mike Heaney's new book, he's, he's, he's uh, watching, maybe tell us more about it later, um, The Ancient English Morris Dance, that's the name of his book, he, he reports that the first outing of the Hindley Green Morris Dancers was to Goulburn in 1892. And this is where the team trained in Abram danced in 1887. And the local reporter says, 
They varied previous programmes by going through their quaint dances as they moved along the streets. The novelty proved very acceptable. So there's an implication, an inference from that, that the Abram dancers didn't process along the street in 1887. Um, I might be reading too much into it, but uh, in, uh, it could well be that a processional dance performed in 1901 might have had, sorry, there might have been a processional dance in the 1901 performance because by then processional Morris dance was the norm on the Lancashire Plain. But it wasn't in 1880. So that's my guess. It only came in much later. But that, that is supposition. And then also from Mike's book, I was a bit amused by this. Um, he comes up with the term Abramers. Uh, it's from a new dictionary of all the cant and flash languages, both ancient and modern, by Humphrey Tristan Potter, published 1795. Abramers, or maybe Abramers, naked, dirty beggars, the lowest order of vagrants, and antics, Morris dancers, a spe species of Abram men called Merry Andrews. I don't think this has got anything whatsoever to do with uh, Abram Morris dancers. Um, according to Green's Dictionary of Slang, certain inmates of the Abram ward of the hospital say Mary of Bethlehem in London, better known as Bedlam, they were allowed to go out begging on a number of fixed days per year and the Abram men posed as these licensed beggars. And there's a rather wonderful report uh, which you can get from the British Library online uh, from the Bellman of London by Thomas Decker. It says, of all the mad rascals, the Abram man is the most fantastic. The fellow that sat half naked at the table today from the girdle upward is the best Abram man that ever, that ever came to my house and the notablest villain. He swears he has been to Bedlam and will talk frantically of purpose. I just thought it was an amusing aside that. So we've talked a lot about the dance and moving on to the Morris dance of the Garland. I haven't actually, for those who don't know, I haven't actually said where Abram is. This map shows Wigan at the top. Uh, if you don't know where Wigan is, you're going to have to go and look it up. And then Abram down at the bottom. This area at the bottom uh, was known as Dover. There were six townships within Abram. One of them was, sorry, six hamlets within the township of Abram. One of them was called Dover. And where the yellow highlight is, that's approximately uh, where Park Lane is. So moving in on Park Lane, that moves, you can start going east-westish here, and the Morris Dancers ground is where the yellow blob is. So that's what it looks like today. And you can see this modern housing to the northwest of it. When we first started dancing in 84, uh, that area was all an industrial estate, including patacks, as some of you might know, uh, from their curry, curry sauces and uh, chutneys. They moved to Lee these days. But before that, it was a colliery. But you can see the Morris Dancers Ground is very much on the edge of the settlement. So why would the Morris Dancers Ground be outside the main settlement of Abram? Well, it wasn't always. If we go back to the 1786 map, um, again, I've highlighted Park Lane, and you can see that there are quite a lot of farmsteads and things beyond where the Morris Dancers ground is. So far from being um, at the edge of the settlement, it was probably very much in the settlement. And in fact, there's a, a lady called Norma Ackers who produced a, a pamphlet called Early Victorian Abram. And she says that there is some evidence from field names that the original settlement of Adbergham was near the Morris Dancers ground. And I, I think she's uh, alluding to the fact that there's two adjacent fields lying to the other side of Park Lane from the Morris Dancers ground. Um, one's called Big Town Field and one was called Little Town Field. And immediately to the east of the ground there's a field called Intake, which might mean the original enclosure 
and the Old English meaning is land taken in from the moor. But the earliest written record of the name Morris Dancers Ground comes on the Ordnance Survey map 1849. Zooming in there you can see this Maypole house is shown, Morris Dancers Ground is there. Um, um, you can see it's generally a, a very rural area, although there is a, a railway line off to the east of the ground and it's that, that fed Bickershaw Colliery, but for anyone who does know the area, that is not Bickershaw Colliery that you might remember. Uh, this colliery was renamed um, Avram Colliery. If we go on to 1892, you can see there's a few more uh, railway lines being built, uh, but at the end of the day, the Morris Dancers Ground is still in a rural area. But by the time we get to 1908, You can see there's the Maypole colliery has been sunk to the north. Uh, this railway line right alongside uh, the Morris Dancers ground now, and there's some buildings off to the south. Um, and 1908, incidentally, is the year there was a, a terrible underground disaster that killed 76 miners at that colliery. And by 1929, you can see it's completely surrounded. You've got Maypole College to the north. You've got railway lines now on either side of the Morris Dancers ground. Brickworks to the south. And there is marked, you may not be able to see it on your screen, but it says, this, it says stones. So they're the stones which are mentioned by Maud Carpel is delineating the ground. So 1921 was the last performance. Um, so there should have been a performance at least by 1922. And uh, local farmer, Mr Rigby, wrote to the, um, the local council, the UDC. Uh, and they considered it. And it was Jeff Hughes found these in the local minutes. And... Uh, it was resolved that they would put some stones in and the report from 1924 said the four concrete posts are fixed. So it's there the concrete posts which Maud Carpenter refers to and are shown on the Ordnance Survey map. 18, sorry, 1968, William Wright, who was the son-in-law of one of the 1901 team and former chairman of the Abram Urban District Council, he applied for village green status. And this was granted, it became final, final in 1972, and then it was granted common land status in 1975. So hopefully it's okay for now. So a brief synopsis, I shouldn't have shown that picture just yet, let's go back one. A brief synopsis. 1850, it was said to have been left to the young people of Abram about 100 years ago. In 1880, it's a piece of ground on Miss Chadwick's estate. And in 1932, Maud Carpley's corresponded with William Aspinall, the first clerk to Urban, Abram Urban District Council, and the solicitors for Wigan Coal Company. Neither was able to cast any light on the ownership of the Morris Dancers ground, although William Aspinall did say that 50 years earlier, i.e. in the 1880s, an effort had been made to ascertain to whom the land belonged but no definite information was forthcoming. So if we go back to 1845, extract here of the tithe map. Um, and for those who have seen tithe maps before, every um, bit of land has a number attached. Oh, it's a bit confusing this because it's oriented almost through 90 degrees, so north off to the right. So it's a part lane now runs from top to bottom instead of from side to side. And Maypole House is there. And if I zoom in on it, that small area there is uh, the Morris Dancers ground. And it's got the number 370. And alongside the tithe map, you get a schedule. This is the schedule actually from a few years before. But if we look at the schedule for 370, 
it said lodge okay, and it's pasture and it's got a side it's just part of the tenement the maypole house tenement uh, which is owned by adam chadwick um, and tenanted by thomas and william lyon and the total size of that tenement is 49 acres two roods 17 perches so that includes the land uh, of the Morris Dancers Ground Lodge. And it's shown there, tithes would have been paid on exactly the same as the, the rest of the land. I've uh, just lost where I'm at. So the, the actual size of the Maple House tenement is shown there. Uh, it's the one that's surrounded in black, so it's on either side of Park Lane, and then butting onto it is land owned by Henry Worsley. The Chadwicks owned a lot of land locally. They, they had three um, tenements, and most the other two, were, I think, were bigger than this. Um, but they also owned quite a lot in um, conjunction with other people as well. On the uh, when Adam Chadwick died, uh, it, the, it passed by his mother to his sister, Miss Elizabeth Chadwick, who lived in London. Um, Adam Chadwick himself hadn't lived locally. He was down in Devon when he died. Um, Miss Chadwick died in 1883 and the farm then passed to a distant cousin, Thomas Parker Dixon, who also lived in London. Now, as I've said, the size of the tenement was 49 acres, two roods and 17 perches. And that's exactly the same size uh, when Thomas Parker Dixon advertised the tenancy in 1886 in this advert here. The, uh, in other records, the tenement shown as 21 acres, considerably less. And that did confuse me for some time. And then I found out that this statute measures, which this is, there are also local measures, especially in Lancashire and Cheshire. And uh, Abram lies within the uh, area of West Derby, or the West Derby 100, and they had two separate local measurements and a couple of very, very local ones. Um, and the, the, their sizes are considerably larger, their acres. And in fact, Bickershaw Colliery was still using local measurements well into the 20th century. But from various tax assessments, I've been able to show that the tenement, uh, including the Morris Dancers Ground, was in the ownership of the Chadwick family from at least 1781 to 1894, when Thomas Parker Dixon sold off some of the land for the Maple Colliery. I think we can be reasonably, reasonably certain the Morris Dancers Ground was part of the tenement for that whole period. And throughout that period, the tenement was tenanted. I've done that bit. Sometime prior to 1781, there was a re-measurement and re-evaluation of the lands in the area. So it's not possible to deduce if the Morris Dancers Ground was part of it. But it does seem likely that it was still part of the tenement. But we can take the history of the tenement further back from various wills and tax assessments, the tenement was in the Chadwick family from at least 1700 and probably earlier. And until the 1750s, the tenement was owner-occupied. But from at least 1756, I've lost my mouse. From at least 1756 onwards, it's tenanted. So that says, Mr. Chadwick for James Dixon's uh, and then it was James Dixon was a tenant and following that was Joshua Dixon who um, I'm assuming was a son but I'm not positive and for any Abram people in the audience at the top it says Mr. Gerard uh, for Harrison House or Mr. Chadwick's tenement. Mr. Chadwick's tenement is now what's called Chadwick's Farm um, on, and that's on Crankwood Lane. It's just below the Morris Dancers Ground, but the Chadwicks never actually owned that. They only ever uh, rented it.
So, although the owners hadn't lived in Maple House Farm since the mid-1700s, and didn't even live locally until after the late 18th century, they continued to uh, maintain close ties with the township. Uh, Elizabeth Chadwick and her mother, uh, Mary, were major ben benefactors in the building of a new school. Um, and like on her death, Miss Chadwick left her uh, £200 for school and £200 to Adrian Abram Charities. And £200, I did that calculation before lockdown, so it might have gone up, but it was about £25,000 then. But those close connections appear to have been lost when the lands passed to a distant cousin, Thomas Parker Dixon. Um, John Leyland, who I mentioned earlier, used to visit uh, Elizabeth Chadwick when he went to London, and she'd give him money um, to uh, bring back um, to Abram to buy flannel for distribution on, uh, on Boxing Day to the people of Abram. Now, although the name Morris Dancer's Ground appears to be specific to Abram, there are other places where similar stories exist, and these are some of them. I'll let you read them. You know, the, the difference seems to be between those examples and the Morris Dancer's Ground that it's usually the people who are there who, who claim their rights because of they've been doing it since time immemorial or whatever. Whereas in Abram, the story is that the stipulation for the activity of, of Morris dancing supposedly comes from the original owner of the land. Now the newspaper article of 1850 refers to a plot of land bequeathed to them the Morris dancers some hundred years ago. And that's approximately the time that the tenement changed from being owner-occupied to being a tenancy. So it's just possible a, a stipulation was built into a tenancy agreement when the last owner occupied John Chadwick moved out of the property. Alternatively, even if there is no such stipulation, it's a likely time for such a story to have arisen when the owners moved out and away from the area and tenants moved in. And there are other places with the name Morris attached, for instance in um, Bolton there's Morris Green. Um, now that could just be someone's name called Morris. Or it might have been a place where Morris dancing took place. I failed to find that out today. It's all I can find out. There used to be a flagpole there. And Mike Heaney pointed out to me that there was a, there's a Morris dancer's cottage and plantation on the Pearlthorpe estate. And if you uh, look at the tithe map for that, it's just called, the, the, the land's just called Moresque dancers. I believe the relevant papers for that place are held by Nottingham University and are uncatalogued. So if anyone wants a project, there's one for you to uh, go and look at. So there's no way of knowing if the story is true or myth without further information. But we can say the ground has been used for leisure purposes since at least 1739. And so these are from the constable reports. And these all refer to bonfires at Lodge. So 1739... To a bonfire at Lodge, five shillings. 1741. For calls to the Lodge and fetching them, ninepence. 1743. To calls and ale at the Lodge, two shillings, and I can't read the pence. And the last reference that specifically mentions Lodge is 1751. After that it just says Dover, so that may have been at the Lodge or it may have been somewhere else in Dover. Anyway... I'm going to finish now, but here's a few pictures of the Morris Dancers ground before and after restoration that Jeff Hughes put together. Uh, when the Morris Dancers revived in 1984, the posts which were erected in, nine, were erected in 1924 had long since gone, and the state of the ground was terrible. Um, it was hoped to get the ground restored in time for the 2001 centenary of the last traditional dance. But as is always the case, these things take longer than expected. But with generous grants and support from Wigan Council, other Morris teams and private individuals, £7,000 was raised. Metropolitan Training, an approved training provider run by Wigan Council, was able to provide the labour at no cost as part of their training programme. The ground was restored in time for the annual dance on the last Saturday in June 2003. So there's the restoration going on. 
and there's the mare and mares was it um, at the ground so just to finally finish here's the full performance of the dance from 2002 now it's not very good recording this but it's the it's the last time we danced there before it had been um, restored um, lots of wind noise on it um, hopefully it won't it was possibly a bit jerky but we'll see um, and particularly look out for the burnt out cars in the background behind the musicians when it shows the musicians <laughs> dance um, so that's the presentation finished but of a quick plug now um, if you fancy joining us we do only dance once a year so it may suit dancers and musicians from other teams who are uh, who might be able to manage uh, one Saturday and a couple of practices beforehand you really don't need to make all the practices as you've seen it's a very easy little dance but we're also welcome new members who've never danced before we are going to this year, for the first time, going to hold an open workshop, which anyone can come to, uh, at the Abram Community Centre on Sunday, the 14th of May, between 11 and 2. 
So anyone's welcome to come along, uh, learn the dance, join in the music, or just have a chat with us. Um, and then we do practice the fourth Tuesday evenings before the last Saturday in June. So this year they start on the 30th of May and the last Saturday is the 24th of June. So if anyone fancies that, and we'd love to see you, and of course, please do come along on the 24th of June. Um, uh, contact details should be able to be found on the Abra Morris Dancers site or Facebook page just by searching on it, or alternatively, uh, contact me, peterbearon.org.uk on 01942816569 and if Pauline could put that on the Morris Fed page when the information goes up about the talk that would be very useful. I shall now stop the screen share and uh All right, well done Peter um, so now's the time we'll have a proper clap at the end but uh, and now it's time for q a um has okay. is there anything in the chat peter yeah but barbara who i, sh I think is is, is an Ab abram resident uh says there's a footpath to and from crankwood to morris dancer ground yes that's correct uh part of that is the old railway line as well yeah, uh, i live in lowton hmm? lowton i live in lowton oh, Lowton. okay so but... often walked that way yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes, you can go, you can go down past it. I, go, I I did it one time um, early evening and got attacked by an owl going down there. <laughs> um, um, you said you're confused by the word tenement. Ten tenement's just uh, the old word for, um, a, I don't know, a farmstead or whatever. Oh, right, right. So th that, that answers your questions, I hope. Thank you. Oh, good. Liam, off you go. Ask your question, please. Um, I wondered what the significance of the space and time between dances was, you know, 21 years or so. I wondered what that, where that came from or, or what, 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 what was, yeah. We don't, we don't know. I say it wasn't, okay. well, it's just had, had the, the story is it had to be at least every 21 years. Um, okay. And it may just be a story. And as you say, sometimes it was, uh, well, 12 years possibly or even 11 depending which which date you believe for the 1860s thank you are, are you going to come and join us then now you've seen how easy the dance is and it's i don't know about the dance but i've i've got a train booked to to get there on the on the 24th um i can't remember what the the nearest train station is and then there's just the bus that that goes there so i'll uh, i'll definitely be there on the day excellent mm -hmm. It's a bit far from Sheffield to come to the practices. I think fringe. someone can give you a lift, actually, Liam, from Sheffield. <laughs> we'll organise that. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> we'll have your arm twist up the back, yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, Derek. Yep, thank you very much, Peter. I'm not a musician, but any thoughts about the um, any other versions of that tune or similarities about where the tune is also found? There are parts of the tune appear in lots of other versions. Uh, uh, I mean, there is parts of Long Morris in it, or Rush Cart Lads. Uh, there's parts of Cross Morris in it, um, which are sort of the two basic Lancashire tunes. Not that you'd know it from what most, most Morris teams use these days, but yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, beyond that, uh, not really, I think. I'd, I'd love to know what instruments they were playing on the. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Margaret? Sorry, technically having to work out how to unmute. It was just a quick question for Peter. For those of us who might be interested in playing the tune, who have diligently been trying to learn it, <laughs> um, is there a recording that you can recommend if we want to, um, want to play, to practice playing along prior to the practices? Is there a good version that is reflective of the dance you're currently dancing and so on, just so we can get the speed and so on correct? Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the one with all the wind noise on you just heard, and that, I mean, that's it's pretty accurate. It? The sound isn't too bad on that. It's just as, as long as you can block out the wind noise. Um, and is that available on the website? I can get you a copy. 
I, I, I'm, right. I've got it. Have I got it's on my computer, so I can, can, I can sort that out. Yeah, we can put it in the email that I send out afterwards with any other. I have tried to persuade. I have tried to persuade um, Denise to uh, to let us have a recording, but I've not got an answer yet. So I'm guessing she's chickening out of that one. <laughs> what it? What are you going to play it on? Not uh, the Northumbrian pipes. <laughs> no, they're not an external instrument. Unfortunately, I don't think they'd stand it. And having experienced the somewhat deluge of a downpour last year. Um, I'm going to probably play whistle. So uh, sorry, yeah, because it would be nice on the pipes, but they don't do well outside for that length of time, unfortunately. Any more questions for Peter? Oh, I've killed you all off. Surely <laughs> <laughs> not. I mean, if anyone does know of anyone at all who might be interested, we are all getting a bit long in the tooth. Oh, Derek wants another question. <laughs> Go on then, Derek. Hi, I just wondered whether you, or perhaps even uh, Mike Heaney, who's still here, um, had any sort of um, mm, reflections about, um, you know, all, all the, the peculiarities of, of Abram, um, perhaps the, the dance itself, but all this 21 years business, the land, the property, you know, the, the location of the dance, uh, uh, you know, within a context of um, Morris dancing more generally um, uh, and perhaps custom more generally. Just, just wondered if anybody had any reflections on it. Go on, off you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for my hand to come in. He's, gone. <laughs> um, he's, keep, uh, he's keeping quiet. Oh, no. Um, uh, I have no real reflections. Um, it's, it's very interesting, the Abram dance, obviously. And when you look at Abram and you look at Lim, they always strike me as a fairly... As, if, if I don't, if I say primitive, I'm not being derogatory. Um, they reflect an earlier stage in Northwestern Morris dancing um, that takes us back further towards some of the older stuff. So I'm always interested in that. The 21 years, I think, 21 years is just a a common legal term to, for for something to run, and I think it can just be just plucked out almost at random, you know, 21, whatever it is, seven years is another one. But I don't think there's anything very specifically um, Morris related in the 21 years term, but it's, it's just general legal, I think. But as, as the dance itself, I mean, the, the 1851 talks about um, at the end of the dance, the flicking their handkerchiefs like, to, to honour the Queen, honouring and congratulating Her Majesty. And that, that has something of the, like, um, the earlier references. And I, I know when um, Steve Rowley did Rose Moresque, um, and, the, and they, they sort of uh, flick the handkerchief, handkerchiefs towards the woman who stood in the centre, if I remember rightly. Uh, not quite where he got that from, I don't know, but uh, it always struck me is it a remnant of that or or does it just mean that what we do now we went into the center flick up and come back again okay now a question from shirley and jerry so um i was wondering about the dissemination of the dance so do do you know have you sort of researched that whether um from Maud Carpley's publishing that, did that, did people then learn it, or is it a more recent thing that other people are learning the dance? I think I, I haven't looked at that, but I think it just became one of the standard um, AFDSS dances uh, mm. that, that was done. Uh, and if you, if you, if you search on Abram in the newspapers, uh, so after that time, it's it was regularly done, and it's, it was done at the Albert Hall. Uh, events and things like that so yeah it just became part of the regular repertoire maybe because it was quite easy to learn and, and uh, so people could do it but uh, yeah 
I think it was uh, very much seen as being a dance that, um, well, it involved both men and women in, in these performances. The Royal Albert Hall was ideally suited. It's a sort of, you know, vaguely circular uh, arena that they were using. It was very often used as a sort of opening dance um, uh, in, in those Royal Albert Hall festivals, you know, particularly in, in the interwar period. Um, and and perhaps that reflects the idea that, uh, although they didn't know an awful lot about Northwest Morris dancing at that time, that it wasn't seen as being a Morris dance. It was seen as being a, you know, it, it was put to a different purpose, if you like, and that was as, as, um, uh, as a spectacular uh, dance that could involve lots and lots of people. And one of the things is we found that the the best number for doing the dance is 14 and 14 does get mentioned in at least one of the reports although 18 gets mentioned in the golden one uh, i think it does depend quite how fit you are but you have to get round and back to your partner now these big versions that the fcss did and they're certainly still done uh, in the states um you got to go around and they they, they must just drop in to an appropriate partner how they work that out i don't know uh, because it's quite amusing if anyone does mess it up what what some someone thinks i'm back to my partner now i need to stop and then everyone behind them goes bum, 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 <laughs> because the, the others are all carrying on um and that still happens despite us having been dancing since uh 1984. um so yeah i don't know how how they did actually work that on the on the really big ones mm. uh, if you look at um, the, uh, I think a couple of those um, Pathé News clips that have been put on how many Morris dancers are on Facebook, uh, I think um, they were put up again recently. I think there is a clip of um, of Abram being danced uh, in the Albert Hall, or perhaps there's one an outdoor festival as well. But th those big, you know, that those big. Um, sort of pathy news reports of uh, of EFTA's um, activities. Uh, I've definitely seen it there some on some occasion on some of these clips. That just reminds me going back to the earlier question about music. Um, the when Manchester Morris, I was I danced at, when I danced at the Albert Hall with them and we did Godly Hill. Um, there was a very earnest chap came up to us at the end and he was wanting to to know why we were using the tunes um, from Abram. And of course, there is just this big crossover of Long Morris and, and Cross Morris. I think Maggie has something. Hi, Maggie. Hiya. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you, fine. Okay. Um, I think Derek's partly answered my question. I just wondered if there's any other earlier reference of women dancing it. Um, or is it always young men? I mean, there were pit girls and things about, but... Oh, that's later. That's later. You say it was a rural area earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and not till the 1901 performance do we start. Right. Um, miners in, uh, the Colliers, before that, there, there weren't any. Oh, uh, I see, yeah. There was Bickershaw yeah. so in 18. But the, there's no subsequent... I mean, I know a lot of... There are a lot of women dan who dance it now, but uh, uh, I've just wondered if there's any records, earlier records, than uh, what Derek was mentioning no. in the Albert Hall. Uh, no, I think I think that's all a product of the FDSS. Yeah. Of it. Um, yeah. Thank uh, you. Actually, I've just noticed Jane Cunio has put one in the. Um, in the chat about uh, going back to have we, for for Margaret, have we got a version of the tune that Denise did for the lockdown outing? I'd forgotten all about that, so we may have. Any more for any more? Could I just say, this is John Alexander, um, a previous musician of ours recorded the dances we did with Manchester Morris men, and Abram is among them, uh, would probably have to look to him, that's to Howard Mitchell, for permission if anybody wanted to uh, have a copy. 
Right. So it's in your archives, is it? Manchester yes. Well, so I'm, sure, I'm sure we can find a copy. So. <laughs> so sure we're, we're, all, we're all involved in it, so we don't take videos and things ourselves. <laughs> uh, there might be something on the commercial one. that was. There was a commercial uh, recording made at one point. Um, I'm not sure it shows the dance all the way through. I think it because it cuts off to uh, Jeff being interviewed. So you've got the music in the background without actually showing the whole dance. The, uh, I was just thinking, I hadn't said, but after we've danced on the Boris Dancers Ground in the past, we did used to more or less do the seven and a half mile route from the Saturday, but we used to do it in reverse. Uh, these days, since, since lockdown, it's become, we did, we did the token gesture um, in 2020, and the following year we only danced on the Morris Dancers Ground and nowhere else. Then last year we did a just a short one afterwards. Um, this year, because being the 40th year this year, uh, we are going to try and expand it and make a bit more of it. Um, but we don't think we're <laughs> the age of us now, we don't think we can expand it back to being seven and a half miles. So, some new blood would be really good. So, if anyone knows anyone who because they don't have to live locally, really. And, and if they could make that one one day practice I mentioned on the Sunday, the 14th of May, three hours, uh, they could learn it in that time, Liam. <laughs> Maggie's got another question. Yeah, it just occurred to me, is there a portable Maypole if it goes touring round? Oh, yes. <laughs> Could you, could you could you not see that was on the no I couldn't I missed that that was that was on the the recording I did at the end the, yeah because that was done before the Morris Dancers Ground was um, um, refurbished and we do have oh, a maypole we do have a maypole we put up for the Morris Dancers Ground but yes no the portable maypole goes round with us and oh I would, great and I would Smashing. love I would I would love someone this year now we know about the um, uh, the evergreen bush i'd love one of those to go around with us as well so if anyone wanted to have a go at making <laughs> an evergreen bush to do, and just go around with us for the, for the day that would be nice as well excellent <laughs> that's a job for liam <laughs> no we want him dancing <laughs> brilliant okay well thank you peter and um, can people unmute them and give Peter a massive round of applause, please. I'll give you a couple of seconds to unmute.